this is another uh, dinner that Jesus was having in a Pharisee's house that um, we had talked about before that Jesus liked dinners and he, he you know he um, always enjoyed having company with people and having dinner we see that all through the gospel in his life so that may be one of the reasons as a church we like to have lunches every month at least here in this church we love to have fellowship we love to have food also and every one of us um, is very good at bringing the best food that's another great thing for this church that we enjoy the fellowship but in this particular uh, dinner that Jesus was invited was with the Pharisee Pharisees are not in the usual circle of Jesus Christ because he criticizes them every day Pharisees and the teachers of the law he called them hypocrites and he called them liars and he called them a lot of names but this particular Pharisee for some reason invited Jesus for a dinner with him in his house and Jesus went but he didn't know what was coming when you he invited Jesus because here comes the most sinful woman known in that city in that town in that dinner coming uninvited apparently so I mean, I told you about crashing parties and be careful when you crash parties. It looks like this woman came there uh, without any invitation and probably she crashed in the party. But he came with a very uh, important gift for Jesus. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. When this Pharisee, who is a self-righteous man according to the Bible, the Pharisees are self-righteous people, they always consider themselves to be the practicing the uh, faithful in the community and also they are closer to god than others and they look down other people when it comes to spirituality and righteousness so that is one of the things about pharisees but he never probably ever imagined that if this woman would a sinful woman uh, particularly come into his house like this crashing this dinner but there is something that uh, i paid notice to that when jesus comes into my house or my life be prepared be prepared that he will be bringing some people with him there will be uninvited guests coming and knocking at your door and you may not feel comfortable that's what jesus is so if you are thinking that you can invite jesus and be with him and be comfortable in the righteous place where you are and be holy that is not what jesus is about but wherever jesus is the sinners the lonely the grieving the people who are marginalized by the society will crowd up around him so please in, invite jesus only if you feel comfortable around those people because they are going to be with him wherever he is so this pharisee probably was surprised by all of these things about this woman coming in as a surprising guest but she did a very amazing thing when she came there it they say, it says that uh, she was a sinful woman uh, everybody knew particular uh, uh, in the in the community that she is a sinner so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume a bottle of expensive perfume and as she stood behind him in her feet and started weeping and she began to wet his feet with his tear her tears and then she wiped them with her hair kiss them and pour the perfume on them when the pharisee who invited the uh, invited jesus <coughs> said to himself if this man was a real prophet he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is and that she is a sinner and that's what the pharisee <coughs> thought in his mind said to himself that's what it says there it was not just probably for the pharisee probably a lot of people who gathered there thought about that how can this prophet who is a holy man who is a prophet considered by the religious community as a great man in their circles how can he allow a sinful woman to come near them they 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 don't allow that in the jewish practice not only not to mention touching him and how can jesus allow that and they were judging jesus and also this woman at that occasion but jesus knew who this woman was and jesus knew what these people were thinking also so he knew everything that was going around and then he told 
Simon, Simon, I have something to tell you. Then the Simon apparently, the owner of the house, and then because he said, you didn't give me um, water for my feet, and she wet my feet with their tears, and you didn't give me a kiss, but this woman kissed me, and all those things. So the na name of the Pharisee that uh, invited Jesus for the dinner was Simon. So he was talking to him. And also he told him a small story that two people owed money to a money lender. And one of them owed 500, the other owed 50. And both were pardoned and forgiven. And he said, which of them will love that lender more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven will love the lender more. And Jesus said, you judge it correctly. So apparently, Jesus was teaching him that the sinner who was before them, that they are judging, is the one who loves God most dearly because she acknowledged just the, the, the sins that she had committed in her past. And she knows the redemption, the value of redemption that Jesus can give her because she, he can forgive sins. So she came to him and she was full of gratefulness. That's why she brought that expensive bottle of um, alabaster, which is the perfume, and anointed Jesus with that. It is so amazing how the story turns around and then gave the people who gathered around, the judging, the self-righteous people who were judging this woman and also judging Jesus, was taken aback by the teaching of Jesus that it is about the kingdom of God, it's about the sinners, about the people who are suffering and who are the people that society is marginalizing and tell them, hey, you are not welcome here anymore because you are a sinner, you are an alcoholic, you are a drug addict, we don't need you anymore. That's not the mission of Jesus Christ. We have the open doors for our church and our open hearts. Whoever wants to come in and to be with Jesus, welcome here. That is what the ministry of Jesus is all about and that's what the mission of Jesus is all about also. So this event actually follows the raising of Lazarus from the dead. As we read this um, with other passages in the other Gospels, the event comes right after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And during that particular event that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it made a big news in the community. In fact, that was one of the reasons why the Jewish leaders started looking for him and capturing him to kill him. That is when they decided really to finish him off. Because the, resurrection, the raising of Lazarus from the dead really stirred up the community and many, many people believed in Jesus Christ and they were afraid that they were going to lose the power, the spiritual power and the church's power in the community. So that came after the rising of Jesus and this Mary, Mary's anointing also came right after that. And Jesus then tells him, you know, why she did this is because Jesus said she did it for the anointing that you have to do when I am sacrificed and I am being put to death in the next few weeks. That's what Jesus was telling and reminding them when this happened. So she was actually doing an act of worship. According to the Jewish custom of worshiping, they have to bring alabasters, uh, perfume. And when they pour that into the, into the um, uh, fire, it brings up fumes of smoke. Uh, when they do the sacrifices and the worship for the Jewish people. So the whole temple and the surroundings will be filled with aroma when they worship God. In other words, as people of God, believing in Jesus Christ, when we gather together and worship God together, there will be an aroma that's spreading out of this place to this community. If there is no aroma, don't look at me, look at yourself. <laughs> because we are supposed to be the aroma of God bringing honor and glory to God through our acts and then who our, our deeds and in our words in, in wherever we are placed. That is the aroma that we are to be. Wherever we gather, whenever we gather in a group, if you are a Christian, you will bring a special aroma to that gathering wherever you are. 
And this community here that God has given us to share his aroma to this community around us should have that aroma around us and around this church. And that's what she was doing. She was actually anointing his body before his death. That's what Jesus was reminding them. She did it for a purpose. Because of the sinfulness of the, uh, the, the uh, pardon that she received from God for his sinful nature of life and the change that she got in her life. She was so thankful that she paid a lot of money. It says it was almost a year's worth of uh, salary that she had to pay in, a, in those days. That's what um, the scholars are saying. That's what she spent. So our worship brings aroma and, and, and a special anointing to this community where God places us. If we don't spread that, our mission is not going to be fulfilled. We have to spread the love and care and compassion of Jesus Christ to others. That's what this incident is telling me where we placed us. She was also using the opportunity when Jesus was alive. Remember when um, the, the, the women who went to anoint the body of Jesus with their perfume after Jesus' death? You all know the story. They went early in the morning so they can find the body and anoint Jesus' body but they could not find the body. In other words, it is telling me that when you are given an opportunity, use it. And if you don't use it, you will never know what happens. Those other women were collecting all their gatherings and, and perfumes and, and all that spices together to anoint the body of Jesus the third day after his death. But he was no more there in the dead, among the dead anymore. So that opportunity was lost for them. But for this particular lady who was called sinful, she used the opportunity to worship God, to, to anoint Jesus with the money that she had and she bought it and she used the opportunity. So let us use our opportunities that God gives us at the timely manner before it gets too late. Not waiting for tomorrow because tomorrow may not be ours. And then she used that opportunity. And she did not care about what other people thought or other people talked about her. She knew that other people are not probably going to be good, uh, talking good about her. But she didn't care about that. She only cared about what Jesus was going to be talking about her. And she did talk about her because it says that all, what she did will be um, uh, heard throughout the history. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said to them, um, Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to them, to her, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So this is one record that is being reported in all the Gospels. Even after thousands of years, we are still preaching about this woman. Because there is a reason that Jesus was telling her this will be preached about her all through the coming generations that what Jesus said in the other Gospels. So what she was doing was a uh, great work of anointing Jesus and using the opportunity that she uh, got appropriately at the right time and uh, worshipping God with that aroma. It is not a choice between giving God and giving to the poor. Some people in there commented that why did she spend that kind of money? It could have been sold and used the money to help the poor. Many times the self-righteous people think like that. When we gather together and have fellowship and church and all that things, a lot of probably will criticize us. But God's opportunity that God gives us are to be used according to what God gives us. And let us use it faithfully. And some people, they, if you listen to many people's criticisms, you will never get anywhere. So it is not about giving to God and helping the poor. It is simply explaining that was done not as a choice between the two acts, but as a necessity and would no more be criticized in Jesus' day as a modern man purchasing a coffin or helping with a funeral. That's what pretty much she was doing. So it is not about one or the other. It should be both. We should worship God and we should also serve others. Whatever blessings that we have, it is not about one or the other. Uh, so the house is filled with the full of fragrance that everybody knew that there was Jesus uh, having the dinner in that house. Mary also performed an act of extravagant, extravagant worship. 
and also his faith was acknowledged by Jesus and her sins were forgiven. So as I say this, I am filled with overflowing gratitude, particularly during this season. I thank God for this church that God has given us that we could worship together for the last four, five years now, that God has given us many, many opportunities. And we have gone through ups and downs, but God has kept us to be strong and faithful in this community to be a blessing. And I am grateful to uh, my family, my uh, children, my friends, and those who gave me company and gave all us company during this time, particularly during this holiday season. I am grateful I'm, because I am a Christian. And I am thankful for all those who have gone before us. So when I start listing all of these things one by one, there is no end to this list. As many of you, as you do the, during this time of the season, write down a list of things that you are thankful for. Thank for the people particularly. And if you are able, please pick up the phone and call them and give them a, 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 a piece of word, a word of thankfulness to them. I was reading about a 13-year-old boy who was uh, terminally ill. His name was Chuck. And um, this was uh, in a book that I read from Metcalf. And the author of this book actually went and saw this uh, little boy in the hospital. And when he was there, he had a dozens of sheets of paper uh, with writing on both sides in his table next to his bed in the hospital. And then when Mr. Metcalf went and talked to this boy and prayed with him, this boy gave a, this stack of paper to Ms. Metcalf and told him, I want you to give this to my mom and dad after I die. And it's a list of all the fun things that we had done, all the times that we have laughed together. So Metcalf was amazed as this boy, young boy, on the verge of death, even at the verge of death, that he was thinking about the well-being of others. After the boy's death, Metcalf delivered the list to his parents. It listed the first day his mom took him to school. It listed his several teachers. It listed the several birthday celebrations they had together. It listed his dad who took him to the barber. It listed his siblings who played with him and a lot of friends who liked him. He had been writing these for the last several months while he was spending time in the hospital. Even though he was in pain and he was going through a lot of agonies, he took the time to write this so he can get away and forget the pains. He started thinking about the things that need to be thankful. So he, he stacked up so many papers writing these things. He had been writing this for the several months that he was in the hospitals. That made Mr. Metcalf to start a list of his own and then found that he could not finish it as, as he adds newer items every day. And his list still continues. That's what happens to me also. And that, that will happen to you also if you start listing. So let us count the blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done.